to ETN, where we don't do news, we just talk entertainment. Share and subscribe. Hey guys, welcome to Entertainment Talk Nation. This is Rob. This video, we're going to continue the March to Avengers Age of Ultron. We are one day late, but after what happened on The Flash on Tuesday, and then yesterday was Arrow, there's just a lot of stuff going on, I had to clear my head. But, uh... <laughs> But uh, yeah, so this video, so we're going to discuss a little bit about the Iron Man 2 movie, which was the third movie in the Phase 1 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and we're just going to talk a little bit about the character in and of itself. But let's talk about the movie first. So I watched this movie recently again. It's been a while since I've seen it. And, you know, I, I kind of, the first time I saw it, I, I like the movie overall. I, I'm not, uh, it's not as good as the first one, but I don't think it's as bad as some people say it is. Uh, I think the problem with this movie, now looking at it again, is that you have Vanko, which is Mickey Rourke. He's one villain. And then you have uh, Hammer, who's played by Sam Rockwell. He's like the other lesser villain. And I think the problem here is that you had two characters that you could potentially make a very good villain for this movie. But because you're sharing the screen time between them, you kind of cut them both off short. In Venkel's case, he had obviously a very, very good reason to go after Tony Stark. The fact that his father and uh, Howard Stark were very much linked in building the arc reactor. And then obviously uh, Venkel's father went and tried to sell the, the secret for profit and he got deported. Uh, and then from there on, the whole family was just done. You know, I mean, we saw in the beginning of the movie that he dies and then that's when... Vanko begins to build his version of an arc reactor, and then obviously the whiplash, the whole whips, and the electric whips, and all that stuff. And then you have Hammer, who is second to Stark all the time, and now he sees an opportunity to to make a leap forward because Tony is so involved in his suit and taking matters into his own hands. He's just not doing the weapons thing anymore. Um, so. You really, I think they had an opportunity to take one of these two characters and put them in the forefront. And either one of them would have worked. I think Justin Hammer, uh, would have probably, would probably have done better than Vanko in this situation because it makes more sense. But at the same time, Vanko wouldn't have been a bad focus either because of the history of his father and Tony's father. But the fact that they put them together and then when they put them to work together, it was kind of like, it just became comical. You know, he wants his bird. You know, they can hardly communicate. Justice Hammer is just like, ah. Uh, and it's just, it didn't really go together well. It wasn't a very good fusion of two villains trying to get after Tony. They could hardly work together, let alone, you know, try to even take Tony out. Uh, Tony Stark's personal storyline in the movie was very good. Uh, the fact that the very thing that's keeping him alive is killing him, which is his reactor, and the palladium that's in the chest. And that was fine. There was nothing wrong with that. That was perfectly fine. Overall, I think that, I think the enemies, the villains is where they went wrong. And Mickey Rourke, you know, I had no problem with his casting. At that time, he was a bit of a hot commodity. He had just come off getting out nominated for an Oscar, uh, for the wrestler. And, you know, he was, he was kind of a big deal again for a very, very short amount of time. But uh, I don't hate the movie. That's one thing I got to say. I don't hate the movie. I think the movie is... Uh, it obviously has more action than the first one. And it does have a lot of hiccups. But I think most of the hiccups come in terms of the villain. And of course, the end credit scene for this movie was Agent Coulson finding Thor's hammer in the middle of the desert. And then that propelled into Thor eventually down the line. In terms of the character, we know that Tony Stark has been through a lot since day one. Uh, you know, he, from being ambushed all the way now to being a core member of the Avengers and still making questionable decisions. And that's probably the most interesting thing I'm looking forward to in Age of Ultron. How much damage has Tony caused pursuing a technology that could very well, uh, end humanity? How, how much damage has he caused not only to, uh, you know, the world potentially as we see it, but in, tr in trust from his peers, you know, that's what's going to make this movie interesting outside of the all the great stuff we've seen. Because, you know, Tony is very intelligent. He's very arrogant to a fault. And now, you know, we've seen scenes of Thor picking him up by the neck. 
We've seen that one clip of him and Captain exchanging words and Captain getting so frustrated that he rips apart a piece of wood. And, you know, obviously Natasha Romanoff, I don't think, you know, I don't think there's too much fondness there from her. You know, and and we don't know uh, how Bruce feels about Tony. I mean, they kind of work in the same line. They're both scientists. They obviously respect each other. But obviously... The Hulk and Iron Man get into a fight, but see, that's more uh, induced by the hex magic of the Scarlet Witch. So we're going to see just how much what Tony has done in this movie affects the group of the Avengers and obviously the world in terms of how far Ultron goes. Uh, you know, we also know that an Ant-Man coming down, that there's a probably a very good chance that Tony picked off, picked up from the work that was done by Hank Pym and Howard Stark. Uh, if you read the synopsis, it mentions that Tony awakens a dormant peace technology of some sort. I don't remember it word for word. I'm just paraphrasing here. But it's definitely not something that he created. It's something that was started that he attempts to finish, which we find out in the trailer is artificial intelligence, which is what births Ultron, and then all hell breaks loose. So we're eight. Hey, six weeks away, five weeks away from this movie coming out. Uh, it's going to be very exciting. We just got another TV spot today with some new scenes, which is very cool. So that's it, man. The hype train's on. You know, the hype train is going. The movie looks fantastic. It looks like the storyline's going to be better. It looks like it's going to have a little bit more darker moments than what we saw in the first movie. But they're still going to keep that, uh, huma- you know, the, uh, the humorism that has been a staple in Marvel movies for the last couple of years. How they blend that together will be interesting to see as well. Is it going to work together? Is it going to be a complete fail? Uh, it looks like it could possibly work together, but we'll have to see till we watch the whole movie. So what did you think of Iron Man 2? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Do you, eh? Personally, I'm on the fence. I'm like, eh, because there are some scenes I really did like. There are some story elements that I thought were really good, but I personally think the mess up is with the villains, but we'll see. Anyway, next week, we will continue the March 2 Avengers Age of Ultron in the next movie in the phase one of the MCU. And we will review that movie shortly as well as discuss that character and speculate about their involvement with the series so far, as well as this movie coming up. But that's it. That's it. Anyway, guys, this is Rob signing off for ETN, where we don't do news. We just talk entertainment. Take it easy. Thank you for watching ETN. Don't forget to comment, share, and subscribe. Join the nation's Facebook page to meet other subscribers or visit ETN's Facebook page and Twitter page. Links for all are in the description.